legacy is all about how you contribute to human society. You know, how, how are you, how do people remember how you made them feel and how they were able to benefit from what you did? You know, with my CPR classes, my, you know, research, my research, my STEM files and stuff like that, I always want to find myself doing something that will change someone's life. You know, knowing how to save somebody's life, uh, knowing that, you know, there's a product out there that may be able to keep somebody away from death in any kind of way, you know, because heart disease, once, once, you, once that heart gives out, you know, a lot of uh, the, the, the result is always is always negative, you know, so I want to be able to to help increase the chances of somebody sticking around. You know, whether it's CPR, whether it's developing a, a clot buster, whether it's, you know, educating people on how to to improve their nutrition so that they don't have to succumb to these illnesses. I'm all in, you know, that that's that's what I want my legacy to be. Yo, plug me in. Welcome to another episode of the STEM Plug Podcast. You know, we've came a long way diving in with a lot of you know, STEM professionals, diving into a lot of different areas of science, technology, engineering, and math. And to know, today is no different. Today, we have another amazing guest, someone that has a very impressive resume. We have Tariq. Cardiac. <laughs> and Tariq, man, Tariq is, is amazing, man. He's he's diving into, you know, the area of research and development. He has a lot of things going on with the STEM files as well. And today we're going to dive in and plug in with Tariq and just really find out more about the area of research and development within STEM. So Tariq, how's it going today? Oh, man, I, it's going wonderful, man. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm glad we're collaborating and I look, I look forward to uh to today's build. Nah, for sure, for sure, for sure. So um, that's just, you know, straight, straight plug in, right? So I have a lot of things um, I've seen from your bio just about, you know, how you really got into STEM at an early age, right? You were, um, you were homeschooled and you really looked like you really started on projects at a, you know, at an early age. Yeah. How would you say, how is the process of like scientific research and experimentation um, really evolved over the years since you, you know since introduced to you and now into today yeah man you know research and development changes you know every five to ten years or the way the way science and uh and, and the way scientists contribute to uh science and technology it changes so often right and because of its ability to go through so many changes that's what makes science and technology really exciting you know, because you can be on the cusp of uh, you can be developing a new material one minute and then next year somebody invents something or innovates something. And now it, it can change your whole outlook on your project. You know, you can apply it to that. It'll, it'll, it'll you can apply it to your existing project. And then, of course, it'll it'll turn around and maybe be, even become something greater or something better. It changes. You know, of course, it always changes with, with current events. You know, for example, COVID-19. You know, the way science and the way healthcare approaches how to treat human beings with viruses has drastically changed. The way people, you know, wear personal protective equipment is a lot different now. People pay more attention to how they put their equipment on. You know, people, pay, scientists and, and clinicians pay more attention to how they diagnose certain, vir certain um, viral ailments compared to others. You know, so there's a very heightened sense of er, heightened sense of uh, accuracy when it comes to uh, diagnosing somebody that's dealing with a virus because of COVID. So current events changes things. Personal lives changes things. You know, look at Jeff Bezos with with Amazon and the different things that he's doing. You know, his personal life really affected how he moved, but how he's now moving about in his business. You know, so it's a variety of things that can cause, you know, the way we approach science to, to become different or to change over time. Yeah, no, nah, that's that's a uh, that's a great plug. Right. Like, 
you know, COVID-19 has definitely uh, influenced, I guess, how we look at things and how things sure. are, are, are being built and designed. Um, yeah. You can look at it as both ways, right? Um, it also, right. you know, allows now for, for creativity and different ideas um, that we never even may, may have even thought of, right? Exactly. So how would you say um, kind of the, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic influenced your, uh, your research and your projects that you're working on? For sure. I know in 2020, I came up with a lot of projects, a lot of ideas related to COVID-19. Um, and this is when we were still learning about it and not, <clears throat> we really didn't have enough information on, we knew what the coronavirus was, but in terms of how it was affecting people and the different types of spike proteins and all that, that was stuff that we were just learning in, in the industry, you know, in, in my field, you know, so when we took the time to kind of, and even with the vaccine, and, I, and I'm not going to say what my status is on that, but even with the vaccine, you know, it garnered a lot of attention towards how research and development is done in when it comes to the life sciences, you know. So for me, right, I, I came up with projects, you know, relating to how COVID is detected in a, in a, in a human sample. Uh, I came up with projects on how to, you know, develop ways to, and not, not increase, but boost the different types of uh, immune responders that we have in the body that are responsible for taking out certain viruses, right? So it's, it's a lot, it's, there's a lot of innovation that can take place when there's a crisis going on, you know? So matter of fact, most innovation and a good percentage of inventions happen out of need, out of desperation or out of you know, being tired of something, you know, so that's, that's the beauty of research and development, being able to respond to a situation that is annoying or, or troublesome in a sense. Yeah, no, 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 that's facts. I mean, I, I, I work within, um, you know, research and development myself, um, you know, for, for a healthcare biotech company. And, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're treating, we're, we're building something to, you know, treat cancer. Right. So, you know, when you have a certain, uh, certain area or a certain thing, uh, it really allows you to really come up with that creativity and come up with those di different innovative ideas, right? Yeah, and that's the, that's the beauty of a niche, right? You know, having, being able to kind of uh, hone in on what exactly it is that you're trying to address. You know, with me, it's always it's always been cardiovascular disease and particular particularly atherosclerosis because, you know, with heart disease being so, still the number one killer in the world, around the world, being able to focus on something, you know, you don't, you don't have to be all over the place. You know, you don't want to, you don't have to be working on cancer one minute. Next thing you know, you're working on bacteria, the standard third. If you just hone in on one thing, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to tell anybody how to do these science, but if you just hone, hone in on one mm -hmm. thing, whatever it is that you're working on from that can turn into a whole bunch of other things stemming from that. And then you really wouldn't have to go into any other fields. You can stay a specialist in that one thing. But I'm a big advocate in niche and being able to, you know, find your find your mark or, or mark your or build your legacy from something that build your legacy from one thing and not trying to spread your, spread yourself too thin. OK, no, nah, man, that's that's dope, man. All right. So we, we, we got to plug in a little bit more now. Right. <laughs> so I, I we got to go through your journey a little bit. Right. Yeah. So how explain to me a little bit about, you know, how your journey in scientific research has evolved over the years from, you know, your homeschooling days to, you know, you founding your original man scientific. How that's let's go through this journey a little bit. How did things evolve? Because it seems like you have a lot of uh experience at an early age that's allowed you to have a, a really a expertise and a niche that you're really able to share with the world now. So let's let's plug in some more. Yeah, man. Um so you know, of course, when you're you're going you're you're going from 17 years old to now being 28, there's a natural gaining of knowledge here. You know, it doesn't your knowledge base doesn't stay the same. You know, even within one year. You know, so for me, my men, one of my mentors who is now um, in his residency in endocrinology, uh, I forget where at, but he was doing diabetes research at the time, and this was oh my god, I can't believe how long ago this has been. 2012, 11 years, you know, it's been that long um, since I started. And uh, he told me that 
if you want to really be successful in what you're doing, you have to become an expert. You know, you have to become, you, you don't have to be the one that knows it all. You have to know enough about what it is that you're trying to focus on. And I use that advice from high school to now to really build upon everything that I do. So by the time I graduated high school, I knew everything about atherosclerosis because when I wanted to seek the help, you know, I didn't want anybody to, to be able to tell me no or no, you need to come back. You need to, you need to, you need to get a better understanding of what it is that you're talking about. This disease doesn't work like that. It works like this. You know, when they, a lot of senior scientists and senior veteran scientists and more seasoned scientists can sense when you don't know what you're talking about and they're more reluctant to work with you. Even, even as a teenager, you know, they're impressed with knowledge. You know, if you know what you're talking about and you're trying to get into this area of medicine, it, it would be who of you to, to really understand it before you seek any help. So then when I finally got the help to really, you know, flesh out my ideas and I was trying to develop something that would dissolve plaque buildup in the arteries, right? That was my main project. And when I finally got the help, you know, I got the help because I listened to my mentor when he told me that you have to be an expert. You have to know what you're talking about. So because I knew what I was talking about, I was able to get the help, get more training in, in the laboratory and what have you. And then I uh, pivoted that to developing my own research and development brand because I wanted to own it. I wanted to be able to be the proprietor of my work and be able to take it where I wanted to take it. And I did that. I took it to two different universities. I still own it to this day. It's still mine. Those universities that did help with the project, I was able to take what they gave me and apply it to my own company. And here we are. Wow. wow. That's, that's dope, man. Taking that knowledge and, and getting that from, from a mentor, right? That, that already, already did it, already has been through it. So you're not getting in there, you know, blindsided, right? So I, I always say mentors are, are so important you know, just to have in your life, like you always should have somebody that, that can coach you and just help you that's already, already done it. Right. So that, that's dope. So you talked about different universities. How, how has the, um, you know, the, the funding and different stuff like that been, um, to, to help you build, build your brand from, from these different uh, places. How, how is that going about? Well, the universities that I'm, I'm talking about, you know, Virginia Commonwealth, Virginia State, they didn't actually fund anything. They just provided me with the, the faculty and the staff in the space that I needed to learn more about how to do it myself. You know, so I didn't look to them as, okay, give me money, give me money so I can fund this, you know, do, I just wanted to learn so that now I can take what they taught me and apply it and go out and get my own business funding or what have you. Right. So now, you know, being self-funded and being funded by, you know, private entities, you know, you really have to, you really have a lot of control and say so over, you know, how you conduct your work. You know, you're not bounded by the rubric that maybe the U.S. government would give you when you're applying for federal uh, funding or any other types of, you know, uh, criteria that another, another public entity will, will have you being private and being able to determine the direction of your research. Once it's done, okay, once you have this product, you get to determine where the product is applied. You know, no one can tell you, oh, you know, we funded you. We get to determine, OK, how this particular uh, product will be used and what industry and we'll pay you a certain amount, of course, to have the, the rights to do this with your product. You know, so that control and that proprietary aspect of it is what what original man scientific really is all about, being able to put the control back into the hands of the, of the person who, who came up with the idea. Yeah, man, you 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 talking my uh my language now, you know, just just ownership, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and, and just looking at you know, int uh, you know, owning your own property, intellectual property, your, your trademarks and stuff like that, patents. So let's dive in and talk about that, right? What are what are your views on you know intellectual property and, and patents concerning your uh your medical research? How do you how do you feel about that? The importance of that. 
No, it's very important. The patent patents are, and that's another thing that we do at Original Man Scientific. We we help people on that patent journey. We have a resident patent agent, and he always tells me that your idea is always is only as good as how much you're willing to protect it. We have, and Jabril can say this as well. When something is patented, you know, like I said earlier on, you have the rights to you have the control over the rights to how that product is used, what industry, what market, you know. So it's very important. It's very important. You can't really have the type of impact that you want if you don't control it. You know, you can't get mad if somebody goes and patents your idea, you know, because you were reluctant to protect it. It's not something that, and I don't know if we can, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to quote somebody, right? It's from uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, right? He said that your ideas don't belong to you unless you move out on them. That same idea, God can take it out of your head and put it in someone else's. If you are not actively moving out on them. So don't get mad. You see on TV, your exact product, exactly the way you wanted it. Don't get mad and see, see oh man, they, they, they took my idea. You can't take ideas. If somebody takes something, though it can only be taken if you protected it, then it's considered taking it, you know? So we got to just be mindful of um, how we sit on our ideas and not really take the intellectual property and, and put it to use. Yeah, man, you, man, you, you speaking to the choir right now. Like I'm, I'm definitely, uh, definitely feel the same way. Me, myself, you know, I, I've, I've filed about five trademarks this year. Um, so yeah, you gotta, you gotta protect, you gotta protect your brand, right? Like, like you said, and it, it might be somebody in a whole nother country that might see something about your, your, your brand or a product that you have. And if you don't have that protected and you know, what can you, what can you do about it? You can complain, but legally you can't do anything. It's better, you know, it's better just to pay that investment to protect it and everything before, you know, it, it uh, it kind of gets to that point. Or, and, and if you can't really, you know, afford to, to protect it the way you want to, just start doing it, you know, because there's one thing, for example, right? Like I said before, Mr. Farquhar, you say your ideas don't belong to you unless you, you're working on it and you're, you're trying to bring them to life. Well, if you're working on it and trying to bring them to life and you don't have a product yet, that's you, you know, working your idea. So then maybe you do have a, a, a right to be like, oh, you know, how, how this dude going to come out of nowhere talking about something, he did this, and everybody knows I do it, <laughs> you know? It's stuff like that. And then you can take the, if if it does go to court, you know, you can take the fact that, okay, this product is already in use, you're using your product, you're in the process of getting the patent, then that person can't come around and say, okay, you know, I I did, I'm, I'm the originator of this, you know? But you have to be constantly working on what it is that you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, no, nah, that's that's facts, bro. So I, I guess another question I have is like, you know, with you being in, uh, you know, research and development, I'm sure there's a, a lot of different um policies in play or different stuff, right? So what role does um science policy really play in, you know, the shaping and the of your research and your uh development? Yeah, uh, I'm I'm a big advocate for those who are in the sciences to actually lobby for us. When we have, I can't think of anybody off top by name, but there are a few people that. I don't dabble a lot in government like that <laughs> or, you know, policymaking. If I do policymaking, it's, of course, on my end with my own business entities. But just look at, you know, what happened with COVID and, and the policies that were related to whether or not people can stay on their jobs because of, you know, the vaccine or being able to take the vaccine or what have you. If, you know, you have people lobbying for you that are in healthcare that are in sciences, it's, it's a, it's better, better policies come from that. It's nothing worse than having a, a medical director over a hospital that has no medical background. That's my opinion. <laughs> you know, to me that, that just doesn't add up in having a CEO or somebody in control of something, but they have no type of, uh, they have no sense or no experience in that particular setting. And here they are writing laws and writing policies and procedures and, and stuff like that, or going to the to the Senate or the Congress and lobbying for you and what have you. Nah, these people need to be those who were in the trenches, not with you, but in the trenches at some point, you know, making some making some type of impact in their field. You know, so policy 
needs to be addressed by those who are or those who are working or have worked in the types of policies that they're trying to um, push forward. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's definitely uh definitely facts, right? Especially you know with the the I guess uh, social media age now, you know everybody can kind of have a say so, and then you know yeah, know everybody's they, an expert. <laughs> <laughs> everybody everybody's an expert now, right? Right. Um, but uh, but no, definitely with you, man. Definitely with the with the STEM files, man. Definitely always tuned in to you all. Definitely, you know, amazing content. Like always plugging in some amazing, you know, work within the scientific community, right? How have you, uh, you know, really utilized those digital platforms to to make scientific information more, you know, accessible to our community? Yeah, you know, well, we're we're definitely still growing. We're we're still in the phases of we're not. Let's let's put it this way: we're not satisfied with where we are, but we're grateful for how far we've come in our platform. We used to be on Blog Talk Radio. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Blog Talk was like is like a uh, it's like podcasting before podcasting was popular, you know. And uh, we started in 2016. Of course, after 2020, everybody just up and started a podcast because we had so much time on our hands. But and I try to kind of I try to stay stay away from the term podcast. Not and this this is no disrespect to any anybody that that calls their platform a podcast, but Podcast is just is such a uh, common term, you know. Every, everybody's using it or what have you, and it's a great word. But we try to stay away from that because we we consider ourselves a platform because we don't just podcast. We actually do other stuff. You know, we promote. We do uh, our page is like a hybrid. It's one of those. What's what's the shade room? What kind of page is that? It's like a. Uh, there's a name for it where they just post like content, and then of course gotcha. what it's about. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get. Yeah, you. so. Right, right. So we're a hybrid. We're we're a pod, we're a podcast. We're that, and we're also um, you know promotion and stuff like that. So we don't really consider we consider ourselves more like a platform, more a network. Okay. And, um, we just happen to interview people. <laughs> okay. You know, uh-huh. and uh, social media because it, it changes all the time. You know, one minute you're trying to you're trying to find a share button on on a reel, and they done moved it. The next next week they done moved it, and then they, the following week they moved it again. You know, so uh, being just being able to, if you're on social media enough, you'll know that you'll know the changes, you know, but if you're not on social media, if you don't post, you don't uh, engage with your audience enough, then you'll start to fall behind on the things that are changing, you know. So if you're constantly doing something, constantly building, then you're going to fall in line with how they how they change things now. Social media is not the end all be all when it comes to building a platform. You know, you can do it the old school way, send out emails. You could, you know, go out into the community and do events and promote your, your program that way. You know, so there's always a way to do things if social media is not working out the way you want it to. But it's getting there. It's getting there. That's dope. Now, I definitely uh, understand what you mean by, you know, you're not just a podcast like you know, this is the STEM Plug podcast, but, you know, STEM Plug is an entire brand that, uh, you know, I, I do work within the community, within STEM. I do a lot of STEM outreach, got a lot of stuff going on within STEM. So I, I definitely understand you, what you mean by uh, not boxing yourself in. I, I definitely understand that, bro. So how can our, um, you know, our listeners really stay stay plugged in with you, you know, as far as, you know, the the um, platform, STEM files, everything else you got going on with, they want to look to you to possibly getting a, a patent or anything. How, how can everyone stay plugged in with you? Yeah. So our website is sciencebyoms.com. Uh, science, of course, S-C-I-E-N-C-E by O-M-S, which is original math scientific science by OMS.com. That's our website. You can get to know more about who we are, what we do. Uh, social media science at science by OMS on Facebook and Instagram, the at the STEM files on Facebook and Instagram. And of course, YouTube, which is our, our primary YouTube channel where we, you know, you see all those amazing interviews and, and bills that we have with, um, with people who we, uh, who we network with, but yeah, the, the, that's how you can stay in touch. Um, if you'd like to email us, of course, you can go to, um, science by OMS at gmail.com and we can, uh, touch base with you from there. That sounds good, bro. So I just want to ask you one last question, bro, before we go, right? And I know this wasn't a question that I that I had uh, asked you ahead of time, but I just really wanted to know, bro, like, you know, you, with you doing everything within research and development, building the platform of the STEM files, 
what do you want your you know your legacy to be when everything is all done? What 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 do you want your legacy to be remembered as? I want my legacy to be, and this is why I started research so early, because I didn't want to wait to medical school to contribute to medicine in any kind of way, right? I wanted to scan my life right now, to scan my life at that time to see how I can contribute to medicine at a young age. Um, I didn't get the same notoriation as Jack and Drinker did with the pancreas, uh, pancreatic cancer test. You you remember that, right? Yeah. He was... Um, out of Baltimore, I think, and he was the same age as I was, doing the same thing, but he got all the, <laughs> the recognition. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, same thing with uh, with brother uh, uh, Kevin Stonewell, who's been on the STEM files, and uh, he did something amazing with detecting colon cancer. And uh, I'm not sure how far he is in that, but he was around the same age as I was when I was doing my thing. You know, so I, I would just say, you know, the legacy is all about how you contribute to human society. You know, how, how are you, how do people remember how you made them feel and how they were able to benefit from what you did? You know, with my CPR classes, my, you know, research, my research, my STEM files and stuff like that. I always want to find myself doing something that will change someone's life. You know, knowing how to save somebody's life, uh, knowing that, you know, there's a product out there that may be able to keep somebody away from death in any kind of way you know because heart disease once once you, once that heart gives out you know a lot of uh, the, the the result is always is always negative you know so i want to be able to to help increase the chances of somebody sticking around you know whether it's cpr whether it's developing a, a clot buster whether it's you know educating people on how to to improve their nutrition so that they don't have to succumb to these illnesses, I'm all in. You know, that that's that's what I want my legacy to be. Wow, that's dope, bro. Well, again, bro, I appreciate you, uh, Tariq, for plugging in on another episode of the STEM Plug Podcast. Make sure y'all stay in to, you know, Tariq Cardiac and the STEM Files platform, an amazing platform, very informative. So make sure you subscribe and like and stay plugged in. Thanks, man. I appreciate you.